Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Welcome to The Open Door, a show based on the words in Revelation, I have left an open door before you, which no one can close. This is WCAT Radio's longest-running show, which opened the door to the radio station in October 2016. It's currently offered by Jim Hanink, Mario Ramos Reyes and Friends, and remains open to the love of God in its call to build a culture of life and a just social order through the panel's discussion of the Catholic social teaching principles of solidarity, subsidiarity, and economic democracy. The Open Door also explores nonviolence, distributism, and communitarianism. So join us at The Open Door, where you too can be part of the conversation. Welcome to The Open Door. Jim Hanning here with co-host Mario Ramos Reyes. Joining us again is our regular panelist, Christopher Zander. Today's special guest is Jack Quirk Esquire. We will be expanding on our last podcast as we continue to explore public philosophy. But first, let's begin in prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit, and they shall be created, and you will renew the face of the earth. Lord, by the light of the Holy Spirit, you have taught the hearts of your faithful. In the same Spirit, help us to relish what is right and always rejoice in your consolation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Jack, you are no stranger to the open door, but could no, you tell us... No, I used to lurk around there a while, for a while. Back, uh, back, could back you tell us a, a, a bit about yourself? A bit about myself? Well, yeah. that means I, have to, I guess that means I have to remember it, huh? Let's see. Right. <laughs> I, think, I think I was, I, I think I was uh, born while my mother was fleeing from a hurricane. I was picked up by pirates and then eventually uh, found my way to getting a law degree, but I, you know, that I printed off a Xerox machine. And uh, then I started blogging, got involved with things, you know, uh, I'm I'm one of the founders, actually, of your uh, well, what's now known as the uh, ASP, the uh, American Solidarity Party. Some so call it the rivulet of the future. Uh, I beg your pardon. Some call it the rivulet of the future. Well, I don't know. It it kind of got away from me. I I wanted to I wanted it to be something a little bit different. I was really mostly into the idea of a uh, of a of a uh, of a kind of an interest group, sort of a group of people that would s- serve as a voting block, but uh, other people wanted to actually form a party, and that's what happened. Uh-huh. But uh, that I'm, you know, I, I, uh, I I'm no longer involved with it, obviously, because uh, otherwise you'd hear a lot more from me. But that's, uh, but I was actually there at the inception of the the, the American Solidarity Party. And was there when it was changed? The name was changed to American Solidarity Party. Gosh, you're an old timer. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I was like uh, three of us, and we were talking about. It was actually, uh, uh, you know, the name Dave Frost, I assume. I and do. I was, yeah, right. So he 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 was starting trying to start something called the Christian Democratic Party. And uh, so I gave him a. I got. I got in touch with him. And I said that's a very interesting idea, because I was really, you know, it was the same thing that uh, everybody has when it comes to having a conscience and trying to involve themselves with the political scene. And uh, I said that's that's a very good idea, maybe. So, you know, then uh, so we. That's how it got started. But it was, uh, and then. It, 
but it was uh it, it it's been an interesting uh and and that's how, well you know how the you know Christian democracy was something that uh I used to work on and that actually the original idea was is that it would start out as sort of the uh literary arm of the ASP but then it ended up getting separated from it but um uh, it was a uh, but yeah it all goes back to that so there you go there's my history but, but you, I'm married. I've got six kids. I've I've never been to jail. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> but 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 you know, there's still time. I, I turned off. sixty. I, I turned sixty five this year, and I'm looking forward to Medicare. <laughs> what else do you want to know? <laughs> well, I'm a little surprised you skipped. Hello. Hello. Yes. Oh, he says he's a little surprised I've skipped, but uh, the, the then he skipped out. The uh, Texas like. radio station. I say what again? Oh, you're still there? Okay. <laughs> yes, I'm still you, you, here. You, 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 came, you came back. You, you came back. Your uh, your voice went out for a minute there, Jim. You st- you're still with us, right? I well, f- for the moment, but but I think maybe Mario was coming in. So Mario. No, no, Mario's uh, been here for a while now. No, 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 coming into the discussion. Oh, I see, I see. Well, anyway, you had a question. What? Well, I'm I'm eager to so, answer any question you. Have. Yeah, yeah. I heard I heard you talking about Christian democracy. Um, that uh, for me at least, that means that we need to clarify the foundation of that uh, type of democracy. So we may uh, discuss uh, philosophy first. Am I right? So my question here that we are talking about public philosophy is just what count as philosophy for you? Uh, reasoned discourse uh, regarding, uh, well, for me, largely political and ethical uh, concerns. But it, uh, the beginning for me is logic and and. Uh, how the mind works to uh, discover truth by rational means. Now, there's a broader okay. there's a broader dis- uh, definition that comes from the etymology of the word, which is philosophia, the love mm-hmm. of wisdom. But you know, it, it usually doesn't uh, pertain to such things as you know maintaining your motorcycle or anything like that. It, has to do with the larger issues, which uh, uh, have to do how do we live in this world, how do we organize in this world. Uh, <laughs> but it, 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 it has to do with, uh, but but it has to do with what we uh, can come across using our own mental faculties as opposed to divine revelation, which there you talk about theology. That's as close so, as I can come. So if that then is the case, I think I agree with you. Uh, do you think that the, in the U.S. and the culture at large, uh, here in the U.S., we are deficient in the, uh, that type of reasoning? And so sure. we need to, uh, yeah. Sure, uh, we, how, yeah, absolutely it is. I mean, uh, critical thinking and logic should be taught in elementary school. And, but now it's a... It's a uh, it's a college course, and for that matter, an elective college course. And you know, it's uh, the ramifications of that are severe. And uh, well, you, you can see the result in our political discourse. It's uh, very uh, harmful to a democracy or a republic, as the case may be, when uh, people can't think, and people can't think. And so you, you know, it, it's resulted in the fake news industry, which, uh, which is a real problem. And uh, until something physically happens to somebody, they really don't. Most people don't really understand what's coming at them from the standpoint of the superstructure of government. So yeah, it's a real problem. Christopher, do you agree? Well, I, I guess that, well, first I'd like to ask a question. Um, your definition of philosophy, you seem to see it ordered towards the political order, our, mm-hmm. our living together. 
Do you, is there something ethical? There an... Ethical, you know, there's personal ethics too, but uh, it's uh, but but yeah, it is political. So do you, do you, you uh, subsume um, philosophy into ethics and politics? What about and you know, logic? What Aristotle would call physics or metaphysics. Well, I don't uh, metaphysics. I you know I I perhaps I don't know what you'll think about this, but you know I I suppose metaphysics has its place. I mean, a lot of it is you know could just as easily pass for science fiction. You know, so I mean, I don't you're people when it comes to metaphysics, you're people are speculating about things that you know they have no experience of and. You know, can't possibly know. I mean, there's so well, much. Yeah, but, but I mean, I guess I mean my metaphysics. I, I think the word the term is sometimes misused, but uh, it's basically understanding the nature of being, or, and it, it, it begins right. I mean, if at least at least you're an Aristotelian or a Thomist, it begins mm-hmm. in the experience of the world and uh, contemplating the world around us. So we perceive through our senses, and then come to understand what it means for us. To what existence means for us, what goodness is in itself, what beauty is, those kind of those transcendental questions, and ultimately, well, what, that's, that, that, who, that what God goes is. To, yeah, that goes to the uh, to, to something very basic, and that is, you know, what are defini- You know, you're talking about definitions. Uh, what do these things mean? Is what you said, and yeah, you have to just when you. What we need are is our definitions so that we can engage in discourse. You know, so uh, if if I use a word and you use it differently, we can get into an argument about it, but it's not a very meaningful discussion unless we both mean the same thing by it. So that's what yeah, that's how, that's how I see that uh, uh, being is. One of those things, being is something that people uh, try to objectify, but it's a little bit like looking at your own eyes without a mirror. <laughs> being is, is foundational to everything, and still we try to pull it out of our eyes, as it were, and uh, try and discuss it, but it's uh, really kind of the backdrop to everything. So. Yeah, we, you, you, you know, if, you, if you talk about you know you talk about the is of existence, which you, which you'll find in a syllogism, uh, you know all men are mortal. Well, the R is the being there, and uh, now I'm not uh, I'm not with those who say that being is only a predicate. And I would say that being is uh, really actually the copula, and it's hard to see because it's right there. You see what I mean? Yeah. In other words, we we can't talk. We, it's in other words, it's the ground of all discourse. You can't uh, you can't have any meaning or experience or anything without it. And yet, it's a very elusive concept, and possibly because it's not properly a concept at all. It, it's just uh, it, it's just the backdrop of everything we discuss and experience. Yeah, Jack, the thing you, is, is that you, I mean, you, you could talk started. about. Well, we can connect this discussion, I think, with with Jack's just starting a, a Facebook group called Philosophy. Right. It's amazing. I was able to get that name, isn't it? But it, but it was uh, but it's the only public group with that name. There there's some private groups out there that uh, that use that name on Facebook. But I just decided to start a group called Philosophy. And the reason and why is is because I wanted to have a, I wanted to have a uh, Facebook group that was uh, willing, where there was a serious discussion about those things, you know. And the discussion might be about just the very things that you and Christopher were discussing a minute ago, right? Yes, precisely. Well, I really applaud your your launch. I, I notice at the same time that that you have some participation rules. I do. Uh, now, does that come from the voice of experience, or more particularly 
the experience of talking about philosophy? Well, it comes from uh, my Facebook experience. You know, I, not only other groups that uh, use philosophy, but it's, uh, you know, I want, uh, I want the post to be about philosophical topics, and it, which include metaphysics and epistemology and things like that. But, uh, but anything that legitimately falls under the subject of philosophy, I don't want, uh, you know, but, and, you know, I want, uh, and, you know, there's just a lot, there's a lot of things. I don't want emotional outbursts. <laughs> I don't want uh, name calling. You know, the, the things that happen on Facebook that uh, make Facebook such a, uh, an ugly place to be sometimes because people because like as we had that conversation at the beginning of this program, uh, the ability to engage in discourse has uh, has deteriorated. Or maybe it was never that good, but uh, we've seen uh, Facebook has given us a window uh, into the soul of people. And what what we've what we've seen is is that. Uh, political discussion, ethical discussion, what have you, seems to be a reflection of people's pain more than it is uh, reasoned discourse. And I, you know, not that I'm unsympathetic to people's pain, but I want, um, you know, I, I, you know it, it, it gets absurd. You can't really have a philosophical conversation if people are getting their feelings hurt because they're being disagreed with. You know, I, you, so we want to... Uh, uh, we want to have a place where these things can be discussed, and so I just decided to put it up. It was just a momentary inspiration that I had one time a few days ago. So there it is. Good inspiration. Uh, uh, Mario, i got a, a question here. You probably had the experience of teaching a philosophy course and then thinking to yourself after it's all done, gosh, I hope these kids hear something about this again. <laughs> <laughs> this was a well. I, I actually, I actually did in teach life. it. And Mario, do you think that uh, philosophy face group would be something you could recommend? I actually did uh, uh, teach a philosophy course for one semester. It was an ethics course. Then you know, then they caught me and they said, "What are you doing here on campus?" And they threw me. No, <laughs> no. It was. I actually did. I taught an ethics course at San Jose State when I was getting a master's in philosophy and which was something I just decided to do and I never used it uh, professionally in any way since then but uh, there I was I taught uh, I, I taught an ethics course and we had a lot of fun yeah. but uh, you know it, 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 there was probably a... probably thought I bet you I bet you Barrios had an experience like this you probably thought this this class is ending but the discussion shouldn't and most people in most philosophy classes aren't going to be taking more philosophy classes. And I don't know, Mario. Well, it was interesting. They had a, the students. It it was a uh, it, it was a required course, believe it or not, at San Jose State. And I I don't know if we, I don't know if it was the only option, but they had to uh, pick something within a category. And so I ended up with a lot of sophomores that were fulfilling a requirement. You know, so yeah. it was. It, it, it was, uh, and I suppose, which is why they gave it to the grad student, because, <laughs> but uh, it, the idea was to try and get them to think about what they were saying. And I, I started out the class by saying, I'm not going to tell you what I think about anything, okay, it's because I don't want you to try and gear your papers uh, toward you know, pleasing me. I want you to wrestle with these issues yourself and and think about it. So I did. Uh, I used the Socratic method in the in the I guess I would call the ultimate sense by just you know whatever somebody said, I would challenge in some way. And I'm a lawyer, so it was. Uh, you know, we they teach us to cross-examine about anything, right? Uh, you actually, they don't actually teach you that in law school, but uh, eventually you pick up the skill. So, you know, I was able to uh, I was able to do that, and you know, all I could do is hope that it was useful to them. 
But all right, yeah, I'm still I, trying to get Mario to to comment on this this here development of a Facebook for philosophy and, and how it could be linked with classes, whether they're required. Well, what was is Mario? Uh, did you did I hear you say that he uh, teaches philosophy? Oh, you better well, bet. Oh, oh yes. Oh my goodness. Well, well, he's a real um, philosopher then. Well, the enemy <laughs> of philosophy. Well, I just read many years ago that uh, the the worst enemy of philosophy are teachers of philosophy. But nevertheless, um, I think it's very interesting because that's a way by which you get into the public square. So imagining that I'm imagining that the public square today is uh, Facebook or one of them. Um, but the the point I think I want to ask you is uh, is the following. Uh, if uh, one teach philosophy, I have been teaching for, I don't know, 30-some years, and um, you discuss with students not only about public issues, uh, social philosophy, public philosophy, you talk about, as Christopher said, about their own their own being, their own sense of life, and so on, and how that is connected to the public square. So, and then you want to continue the discussion, and not only continue the discussion, but connect the discussion with what is happening out there, with the political regime, with uh, what democracy means, what uh, liberalism means, or whatever other issue is being discussed in the public square. So in, in your case, I think is well that is uh, is Facebook, but uh, yeah, I'm another, sorry, it's a what? It's Facebook. For you, the well, I, I, to I, discuss. Yeah. right. That's what. I, well, I'm doing that uh, in this particular instance. Yes. Okay. H- how do you see another tradition which was perhaps prior to um, Facebook era? which uh, generally philosophers who were engaged in teaching, academic of uh, very uh, high caliber and renowned academics, publish a uh, uh, newspaper column where they discuss philosophical issues with clear language, simple language, or at least clearer language than the philosophical jargon in order to somehow steer the pot, so to speak. Uh, engage in a dialogue with a wider audience. How do you see about this type of uh, mean uh, using uh, uh, columns in newspapers? I think that would be uh, an, extent, uh, an excellent idea. I wish more philosophers would do it. I wish any philosophers would do it. It would. It, I think it would make for. Uh, I think it would make for great reading. You know, I don't know. You know to. What I, I don't know if it would be a hard sell or not because you know it's how you know what most people associate uh, philosophy with. Well, I I think the public perception of it isn't so high because it's uh, because it doesn't you know it's not something you can do to make money and it you know it's not associated with a profession and you know it's just uh, it, it uh, you know I think that a lot of people have. Uh, a bad view of it because it's just it, it because it's not uh, it doesn't fit well into capitalism I for lack for lack of a better way of putting it it's just not something that uh, it's not productive and so you know you, you'd have to sell an editor on the idea but once you sold the editor if I was the editor of a newspaper I'd uh, I'd look for that I think that would be great but uh, you know I, I I think the topic would have to be something that people were interested in um i i've toyed with the idea i i i've actually i actually talked to my old uh one of my old philosophy professors we became good friends after i was done and um he uh i said you know there ought to be you know wouldn't it be interesting if you had uh a way of taking things that people say in the public square and not taking a position on it so much, but actually, uh, you know, parsing these, uh, what is said and see if it makes any sense from a logical point of view. And wouldn't that be interesting? 
You know, I mean, it's not, I don't know if that's something that people would value or uh, what have you, but wouldn't it be interesting if you just say, okay, here's a column, here's what so-and-so said, here's what, here's what this politician said. Uh, let's parse it out logically and see if this, uh, if this guy's making any sense at all. And that would be, you know, that would be a very uh, hard task because if you, if you, I've actually tried it before. If you ever try to take common discourse and and uh, look at it from a logical point of view, I mean, what you what you usually run into is just a series of disconnected assertions, <laughs> and, 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 and you're not you're not really dealing with a, any kind of a logical argument at all, and. For most, that's uh, for most that's satisfactory, I guess, and so that's why you'll find that uh, people are just uh, basically looking for a confirmation of what they already think, and uh, so they agree or they disagree based on uh, whether they whether they agree with this particular assertion or not, but without actually uh, trying to figure out if it makes any sense from a logical point of view. Am I making there, sense? Yes, <laughs> you do. Uh, I, I have a, a comment about what you said, and perhaps for our audience that may be helpful, I think. There has been a tradition, which is a very long tradition. I'm talking about even 100 years, but over the past uh, 50 years, I have been following, and somehow to imitate the, that tradition, which is a Spanish tradition, which... Uh, is characterized by some philosopher beginning with Ortega y Gasset in the 40s, who mm -hmm. began uh, publishing columns uh, with a heavy philosophical content, commenting any issue that was at uh, that point important to the public, whether it's in, in aesthetics, in politics, in, in morality, whatever the issue may be. And mm -hmm. so he wrote uh, hundreds of columns, which later were gathered in books. And so many of his books were mainly uh, journalistic columns, so mm -hmm. much so that his uh, disciple, um, who died a few years ago, I met him, Julian Marias, one of the greatest uh, personalists in Spain, wrote a famous column I have in, in front of me in my office which says, uh, the title is Filosofía en el Periódico, which means philosophy in the newspaper, where he lay out what is the ideal that he's pursuing or his teacher was pursuing, which make a hard argument or at least complex argument, make it easy for the, for the audience so that you start thinking critically, giving foundation what you think about public square. That tradition still is alive to some extent in Spain, in Latin America, and some places where you see professors of metaphysics writing about politics in newspapers. Now, in the U.S., the reaction that I got from that is that somebody who does that doesn't have quality of work because it seems that between academia and between what is out there in the, in, in the real world, so to speak, a newspaper, there is a there is a gap, and if you read for a newspaper, that means that you don't have the quality for being an academic. So uh, unless you look for the American uh, tradition, you find some people who write or used to write very solid columns uh, based on certain um, view of philosophy. Mm -hmm. I, I read many of Walter Lippmann columns. And mm -hmm. so... And I think that, I think, is um, a way of conveying and get some readership, and perhaps not many, but uh, this is a way that you're somehow moving the, the discussion about issues uh, and being taken more seriously. I think, you know, listen, that sounds great to me, you know. Uh, I, you know, in the English-speaking world, I mean, you know, you're uh, – a large part of the economy here was in the United States was started by a guy who said that uh, history is bunk. You know, so I mean, you know, you you, I I can't speak to uh, what what goes on in the Spanish speaking world, but I can say that here in the United States, you have to overcome the 
prejudice against the apparent non-functionality of philosophy. That's what you'd have to overcome. But, it's, you know, I've, I, but I know I think that's an excellent, but I think that's an excellent plan. Uh, what I would actually like to see in addition to that, however, and I've been feeling this way for a long time, and that is uh, to teach critical thinking at an early age, not just make it some type of, of uh, college elective, but, uh, you know, you teach arithmetic to, y- to young kids, you know, teach them that too. <laughs> you you got to, uh, if, if you look at the seven liberal arts of the Middle Ages, um, logic was one of the, what is the, one of the three trivium, I guess it would be trivia in that sense, but it was along with grammar and rhetoric, it was one of the first three things you studied at the, uh, at the universities. Well, we can, uh, we can start that a lot earlier. And I think that, uh, it would it would make our culture uh, a lot more thinking friendly. I think when it comes to uh, dealing with issues that require that kind of thought, and I really believe that it would improve uh, the democratic dialogue, the necessary democratic dialogue to quite a degree. I really believe that. Uh, Chris, but you know, uh, here's like, like, so, like so many of my thoughts, they don't just, they don't seem to catch on. I have to <laughs> I have to pass this on to a to an organizer or somebody who uh, has the uh, has the gift of uh, of uh, getting people to do things. But I, but I really feel that that would be, I I think that would be a, a, an extremely important uh, social reform if anybody had the wherewithal to make it happen. I have a question. Um, you, you mentioned the seven liberal arts, and one of them, of course, you mentioned it was rhetoric, which is the art of is an art, the art of persuasive speech, right? Yes. How does where does where does rhetoric fit in? Because rhetoric is not strictly speaking philosophy; it's persuasive, but it's not it's not um, no. demonstrative, right? It doesn't demonstrate the truth of a statement. It 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 persuades it of, the, of the truth. So. Right. I mean, it often seems to me as being the intersection between philosophy and the general public. How, how do you see, where does, where does rhetoric fit in here? Because when we talk about, like, uh, columns that people write, are they going to be more um, rhetorical or are they going to be more philosophical? Well, I think that you need, uh, I, I, to be effective, I think you need both. I mean, you can make all the sense in the world, uh, but... If you don't have, and I don't, I'm not much of a rhetorician myself because, you know, but some people are gifted at it. And the, the idea is to uh, persuade as well as to use logic. So, in other words, you, using uh, logic without rhetoric can be, in a sense, arid so that nobody uh, pays attention. But to use rhetoric without logic can be positively immoral, because you know Hitler was a very good rhetorician. But you know nobody can, and <clears throat> so you know you, that's what you have to avoid. I mean, rhetoric has uh, can have some very pernicious outcomes if it's not grounded in reason. And so that, that, that's where you have to be careful. That's why Plato wasn't so uh, enthused about the art of rhetoric. But it, it, uh, it, needs to be, it needs to be done because when you're trying to pass around ideas, you've got to find a way to persuade. Do, do you think um, that the problem so much, I mean, there's a lot of nonsense, a lot of just, a lot, people say illogical things all the time. But the certain extent, there's a certain logic to what people's positions are ba- based upon their principles. Is the problem so much a lack of connection with principles or false principles? Well, I, there's a that's kind of general, but you know the thing is, is that okay? Uh, uh, let, let's let's talk about something that ASP would be involved in. Uh, you see all kinds of people that are trying to say that uh, government laws ought to be grounded in Christian morality. 
okay? And that's something that you see all around. But the thing is, is that uh, when when you get down to the brass tacks, they reach all different kinds of conclusions. You know, I mean, uh, uh, you have um, uh, people that are associating their political views with Christianity and yet see no problem or are, in fact, even enthused about the uh, human tragedy that's taking place at the border. And, you know, that, well, yes, that's right. You know, you, you say, what about compassion and all that? And they say, well, you know, if, if they're here illegally, they got to face the consequences. But, you know, you got children dying, and, I mean, it's, it's just horrible. And so there's, um, you know, I think the thing is, is when it comes to having an ethical grounding, there's, uh, I mean, Christianity's got the highest ethics there are, but, you know, but on the other hand, it seems to me that Christianity has just become a kind of a, a I don't know if a buzzword's the, per, the, the proper term, but it's just, let's put it, just put it this way. Christianity for a long time in Western society was just, you know, something that every polite person supposedly believed in. Okay. After it took over the Roman Empire, after that, uh, it was a matter of social preferment to be a Christian until eventually all polite people were Christians. And yet, there, it, it was just, it's just a name. It's just a word. And, uh, and there's, and when somebody tells you that he or she is a Christian, it's, it, it ends up not being that informative uh, as to what their views are. So there's a, there's a disconnect between uh, that term and the way people actually think about things and what they actually believe about things. They just start with their own views that could be based on prejudice, that could be based on emotion or what have you, and then they just baptize it, and it uh, and this becomes Christianity to them. And so what is and and we still have a segment of that population that still exists even though it's no longer considered to be uh de rigueur so much um but it is uh but it still exists in certain circles so long, mostly in the south or what have you so what we end up with is is uh appellations that that are meaningless and uh, it, so, if Jeff, that's what Jack? you're driving at, there's, there, there's a there's a there's a disconnect between what people identify with and what they, in fact, actually believe. And that so it sounds like they have ethics, but what they really have is just uh, their own beliefs that they've either baptized, and you know, I don't know to what extent this goes on in other cultures, but uh, you know, there's no real. Um, there, there's no real there, there there when it comes to um, any kind of ethical grounding. Jack, is I'm sorry, you were going to ask me a question. Where we need especially to call attention to to the saints among us, to Mother Teresa or to Franz Jagerstatter, uh, mm-hmm. people who make it very clear what the uh, immediate demands of the Christian faith are in a public mm-hmm. context. Uh, is, is that something that would, would help break through? We need public philosophers, but we need, as Christians, to look to the saints and to say, this is what we really want to strive for, and that way we can push to one side a lot of merely conventional Christianity or the, the, the civil religion? Well, sure. I mean, that would be useful if people did that. But, you know, I mean, you, you, uh, Catholicism is a minority religion in this country, and, you know, so if you're, uh, you, you know, you talk about uh, 
St. Teresa of Calcutta, you know, a lot of people are going to say, ah, that's, she's a Mary worshiper. You know, the, the divisions within Christianity create a problem. I mean, you know, with, with Protestantism, and I don't want, I don't want to offend anybody, but, you know, heck, I, you know, I'm good at it. Uh, the, the thing is, is you know, well, it's taking a lot of practice on your part. Yeah, that's right. Let's shift from Mother, the, 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 shift from Mother we, Teresa to, uh, we're all flawed, and a, a flawed saint. Uh, yeah. Martin Luther King Jr. The level of his discourse was was really uh, very high. In many regards, he was a, a public theologian and a public philosopher. I think if you read, as so many of us had, letter from a Birmingham jail, you, you see just what can be said. And right widely read and appealed to over decades now, uh, we, we do have leadership like that, and uh, I think uh, it's so important to keep our eyes on those leaders. Well, I think so. Um, you know, the thing about uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was is that uh, he did something uh, very simple and yet very profound. He just simply took the teachings of Jesus and applied it to uh, the situation that he found. Um, and the teachings of Thomas Aquinas and uh, yeah, 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 right. So, but yeah, so my, my my point is is that uh, yet you know, yes, we can look to extraordinary people like that, um, but to a certain extent, you have to rely on divine inspiration for that. I mean, I <clears throat> I, I have a, an heretical belief that uh, says that uh, Dr. King was actually a prophet. And so, you know, we, can, we can't uh, decide when we're going to have a prophet in our midst, but we can uh, look at, uh, we can look at these people as examples. Now, uh, unfortunately, of course, uh, a lot of people will look at Dr. King, and even though he has a holiday named after him, we've got uh, uh, quite a lot of people that uh, uh, still object to what he brought into the United States. <laughs> you know, he was, uh, he, unfortunately, I, I did not realize to what extent that was still true until Donald Trump got elected, and so now I've, uh, so I'm still reeling from that uh, piece of enlightenment. All right, now you're you're bringing us back to the here and now. That's for sure. And let's let's get back to your your philosophy face group book, uh, mm -hmm. group. Uh, what sort of responses ha have you had on the group? How's well, you know, we've had a few, we, we've had a few uh, posts. It's still nascent it's still uh, just a few people it doesn't have a lot of people in it i invited some people to come in i should i should invite you you can come in all you have to do is answer a couple of questions uh let's see one person posted a joke another person uh lauded nietzsche yeah uh, no, I, I saw that one i was interested how do you handle how do you handle that well i just asked him why what he thought about it. And what um, did he think about it? No, I just asked him why. Why do you think? Uh, I said, you know, I said, why do you think he was such a great mind? And all he says is, well, he was. Uh, wow. And he likes his he, he likes his passion, his unyielding individualism, his unbridled fervor for uh, will to power. So there you go. That's a philosophy. I guess, but you know, I mean, he's grouped with the philosophers, Nietzsche is, along with Kierkegaard and all those others, the, the existentialist group. Well, uh, he, certainly, he certainly is a philosopher and a powerful philosopher, and he has uh, great influence today. Well, he's had, he's had a lot of influence, some of it not so good. Uh, <clears throat> I've often thought that... Uh, to be honest with you, when it comes to the existentialists, I've, uh, I've, uh, I tend to group them as early comedians, you know, intellectual comedians like Woody Allen or something like that. I don't know that it's actually philosophy in the sense that I think about it. You know, oh, or, you'd never say that about Kierkegaard, would you? Sure, I would. Oh, Kierkegaard's comedian. hilarious. Comedian, eh? 
No, he's a comedian. No. He's a comedian. I'm sure he is. Well, you ever, tell us more about that. Tell us more about the Guardian <laughs> comic. <laughs> Haven't you ever read Attack on Christendom? Well, that uh, well, whole thing with Bishop Martinson, and, you know, and, and whether or not he's a witness to the truth. Come on, you don't find that comic. Wasn't, wasn't Kierkegaard a exploding pretentiousness and statism and well, that's a lot comedy. Of that stuff? Yes, that's comedy. Ah, all right. So, comedy as expose of the falsity of conventions. Precisely. Okay. Now I understand you. <laughs> no, I did. I, I didn't mean the you know. I, I, I didn't mean the prattful kind of comedy. Right. I mean, I, I, you know, more of the intellectual comedy, the thinking man's comedy. You know. Well, did, did you find yourself to be challenged by the the Nietzschean who says he's great, and you say why is he great? And you know, no, I don't know. He's, he's I just, great. Uh, no, he, he just tells me why he's great. He, you know, and so okay, he answered the question, but he, you know, in this particular instance, he didn't feel like it didn't seem like he wanted to continue the discussion. I I want to. Uh, I want to try and inspire discussions, and uh, it's not always easy to do that because you know you're you know you're asking people to engage, and it's a very uh, and Facebook well, maybe it's just not a very good forum for uh, trying to you know engage in intellectual activity at that level. So we'll see. You know, it's an experiment. It was a momentary inspiration. No, so we'll I think see if it, 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 we'll see if people. It's a great inspiration, and I hope that it's not a, a, a short-term experiment. I hope it continues. And what you're saying about encouraging discussion, gosh, I think a lot, a lot of in the classroom teachers would say the same thing. Uh, I remember the, your view originally when you were teaching. Uh, you had the, 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 the chance to teach, and, and you said. You were Socratic, and you said you were not going to tell people what your view was because you wanted them to express their view. And, right. and it's the same in the classroom, same with Facebook, same in conversations with your in-laws, right? Yeah. Well, you know, I, uh, I when I'm with my in-laws, I've learned it's best to you know not say anything because they, they get up and leave if I talk. But <laughs> Well, well, you, you know, it's, it's not always that way, Jack. Now, I, I want to report, you know, I've been asking you to report from the trenches the other day. Uh, and my wife doesn't always agree with me, but, but she had my back. It, here, here it was with the in-laws, right? And the discussion uh -huh. turned to politics, and and then it got a lot worse. And brother, yeah. brother-in-law, I got more than one brother-in-law, he says to me, you're two-faced. You're just plain two-faced. I've and seen a wife, picture of you. you only my got wife, one. She had my back. She says, "Oh, if he had two faces, you think I'd let him wear that one in public?" <laughs> yeah, well, that was. Uh, ah, so that I was, got support. I got support. That, that well, so she took that from Abraham Lincoln. That was pretty good. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I'm like my wife, and we both go way back with the jokes, way back the classics. That's both right. In, yes. Both in yeah. comedy and philosophy, we we go for the classics. Uh, All right now, here, here, yeah. I'm going to ask my my uh, co-host Mario and my good friend Christopher. Uh, Jack is telling us about the limits of doing philosophy on Facebook. Aren't aren't those always the limits of doing philosophy? And what do you folks do? Well, do, you, do you listen for so long and push back, or do you begin with the pushback so that you don't have to listen, or is it some mix of the two? Well, I I, I try to keep off Facebook for the most part. But I'm I'm always I'm often unsuccessful. Um, yeah, and I, I when sometimes... you have something on Facebook, it's usually five times more serious and extended than the other items that surround it. So you give way to the temptation, but you do so productively. Well, thank you. But I, I find the medium, it's something I found the same thing with email. I don't understand why it's this way, but it seems like the medium 
seems to encourage lack of thought. Um, maybe it's the, the scroll, you have to scroll down through so many posts. But maybe it's also kind of grandstanding that occurs because it's public, and it's very public. I mean, thousands of people could be reading your post. And it, so it's, people are not so much willing to actually engage the ideas, but to kind of score a victory. It's okay, now you just said public, and we're trying to promote public philosophy. So we yeah, don't, I, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to being public. It's it's just the nature of of the public, I suppose. It's uh, ah. you know, it's it, it, it like for instance, um, when when you had just magazines or newspapers, and you could write a column, the, pre, the, the responses you would get would be through a letter to the editor, right? And people had to take some time to sit down and, and take some time after reading the article to sit down and, and compose this thing and pro hopefully go over it a couple times before they send it off because they knew it was going to be published in a, in, in a less ephemeral form. Um, I think that probably encouraged more thoughtful responses. Not always. I mean, my years as a journalist showed me that, that I, don't, I didn't always get thoughtful responses. But I think it was, the, the responses could be better because they could be it can be more considered. Uh, but with with Facebook and email, the same thing. There's this kind of this tendency to respond right away because you're afraid for one thing. If you don't respond right away, it's no longer going to be relevant. No one's going to, you, you're going to lose the thread of the conversation. Or you just want to make sure that, you know, you, you don't, maybe the worst um, motive is that you just don't want to look like someone's gotten the best of you. So the tendency, I think the temptation is to respond quickly. And I think that's that's a problem with the medium. Uh, and I, I've not seen, I've never really, I've, the best, I, there was one forum, um, Imago Day Politics, which is still up there, but it's pretty moribund right now, where we had really good discussions, I thought, the best discussions ever had on, the, on, the, on in, in this kind of medium. But uh, I, I, for the most part, I've been, I found the discussion very frustrating and kind of uh, disappointing. Jack, did you do anything on Imago Day? On which? I'm sorry. Imago did Day politics. Uh, no, I didn't. That that was uh, uh, affiliated loosely with the ASP. Uh, oh, Imago Day. I'm sorry. I just didn't understand. Yes, I post things there all the time. All right. Thanks for <laughs> thanks for reading it. <laughs> I I I put blog posts there. I used to put Christian democracy there, and then when I uh, decided I was not going to be a Catholic political uh, Catholic political writer anymore because of all the all the poison, I think that that stuff has just gotten to be poison. So I said I'm not going to be associated with this anymore. So now I just went back to my old uh, kind of blog. Being, instead of being a Catholic writer, I decided I'd be a writer who was a Catholic, you know. And uh, so I started posting. I, I, yeah, I put up my uh, stuff on Facebook, and that's one of the places I put my stuff up on. It's called Quirk's Perspective. Yeah. You should, you should go. You should go and read it. It's. Uh, I have read them. You know, I've, I, I think I mostly agree with them. <laughs> <laughs> you say, well, you don't have to agree with me all the time. Sometimes I know, I but I think I have. I, I I can't remember anything uh, I objected to, but I, I, I well, come I, up I, with hey, some... Christopher. I, now I, my memory's coming back. Christopher went on a quirk perspective and argued from a Nietzschean perspective. Oh yeah, I think yeah. So he well, was yeah, the no. one. It all comes out. Well, well, listen. It, it I want to go back to this. I want to go back to this uh, business of looking to people who've made outstanding contributions. Uh, Chesterton was mm -hmm. often encouraged to be more serious. And his mm -hmm. wife said, look, uh, you've done enough columns. Why don't you write uh, another book? And Chesterton, of course, being Chesterton, try, tried to do both, but he never would give way on the importance of journalism, even though he regularly castigated the level of thought among journalists. Uh, so it's not like this problem hasn't been around for a while, and I'm sure it goes way back to the beginning of the story in the West with Socrates, but the, here, here's a role for somebody who's uh, a, a role and a role model for somebody 
who, who wants to do philosophy, wants to do public philosophy, very much realizes its limits, is a, a what we might call a, a grave hyphen merry man. Uh, no one could be more serious about what's ultimately serious, and no one could spoof as spoofingly as Chesterton did about the, the nonsense of the day. Mm-hmm. Now, it's true. He only lived to be 64, and when they had to take his body out of uh, the room in which he died, they ha- had to have a, uh, well, they had to go through a window because they couldn't get him through a door. So it, it took real, real toll on him personally, which I'm not advising any of us to take on. But Chesterton experienced exactly the frustrations that, that, that we are speaking of today, and he was a mighty figure. Uh, and I, I think if we kind of look to these saints, really look to these saints, we can keep our heads about us. Well, I, I like Chesterton. I wish that uh, he and Block, the, what they call him, the Chester Block, I. Uh, I I would uh, I I'd say that uh, you know I I, I wish I, I wish that he'd been a little more systematic, but maybe then uh, he wouldn't have been as good. But yeah, I uh, I there's there's one area in which I've decided that I would not follow Chesterton, and so I've uh, been on a diet for a while. With some success, because <laughs> I was headed in that direction. But he's, uh, you know, I mean, his. Uh, sometimes he comes up with with some insights that he describes in such a way so as to bring home the uh, the importance of looking at the human in the situation that that has to be that has to be dealt with when it comes to political philosophy. So in other words, he's thinking about he's thinking about the human. There's a there's a human aspect to everything that's political. And uh that is something that, that he was able to bring out uh more than anyone, I think. I and I and think that's, know, his, pr- Jack, that, that's friend, his primary uh that's his primary uh contribution to the history our, of philosophy. Our friend Mario think. does that same same thing. Mario again and again says, let's get the person in the center of what we're discussing. And I know that the person of Mario Ramos y Reyes is about to head <laughs> off to a classroom. <laughs> what, what are your final thoughts for us before you leave? Well, well, my that, final uh, thoughts. Oh, his final thoughts. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes. Well, uh, per, uh, precisely, I think uh, the center of our political reflection must be the person, if we are personalists. And so personalism is in itself a philosophy which uh, many people, even academics, that don't know in the U.S., and that's, uh, I think, it's unfortunate. And, however, uh, I think, uh, and, and Jim know about that, there was a column in New York, David Brooke, who wrote about that precisely that what we need in America is that philosophy, personalism, and he mentioned that in a column, which I think made my 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 uh, made me very happy when she, he did that. And so um, that that idea or that um, anthropology, if you will, um, I think it may it should lead us to something you said from the beginning is about uh, Christian democracy. And I think that's uh, another for another program. But I wanted to hear what you have to say about Christian democracy, and whether Christian democracy is a good proposal for the U.S. and uh, a good proposal for now, because uh, American Solidarity Party precisely claim one of the uh, th- three legs is uh, uh, Christian democracy. Well, I think that. Uh... I, I'm a Christian Democrat. I consider myself one, uh, and a distributist or something of a neo distributist. The uh problem that Christian democracy has right now is the darth of Christian Democrats in the United States. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we have to we, we have to look to other things in the meantime, uh, in order to try and bring about well, Christian democratic goals. 
and to include the personalism that you just mentioned. That's uh, that's my feeling about it. I think that Christian Democrats have to try and influence uh, things in that direction as much as they can, but uh, we have to have our eyes open to the practicalities, to wit, that uh, there just aren't a lot of Christian Democrats in the United States. And uh, maybe it's a case of many are called, and we have to call them with a louder, more insistent voice. Well, we, you, we can try. The thing is, is that you have to, uh, like I said, uh, Christian, or you actually use this term, Christianity has be- become conventional, and so uh, I think I found out that merely, for example, uh, the mission of Christian Democracy, the the online journal, was to uh, try and uh, point out to Catholics you know, what Catholic social teaching is and. Uh, try and draw them in that direction, and then I discovered over time that uh, that uh, a lot of Catholics don't particularly care what Catholic social teaching is. They've got their views, and they'll say, well, you know, that's fine that the Pope say that or that the Church says that, but I think this. So, you know, I, I, I guess it was a... Uh, I guess it was just a long attempt at an appeal to authority that uh, I suppose logically should fail, but I hoped wouldn't anyway. But, yeah, you, I think that at the end of the day, uh, if, you want, if, if you want Christian democracy to prevail in the United States, the first order of business is going to be conversion. On that note, since we've come to the close... We want to uh, look at today's gospel, and if there was anyone who was not conventional, it was our Lord Jesus Christ. And today's gospel, uh, Feast of uh, John Bosco, is from the gospel according to Mark. Jesus said to the crowds, this is how it is with the kingdom of God. It is as if a man were to scatter seed on the land and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He he knows not how. Of its own accord, the land yields fruit, first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. And when the grain is ripe, he wields the sickle at once, for the harvest has come. He said, to what shall we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable can we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, that when it is sown in the ground, it is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. But once it is sown, it springs up and becomes the largest of plants and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the sky can dwell in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to understand it. Without parables, he did not speak to them, but to his own disciples, he explained everything in private. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Hi, everyone. Dr. John Aquaviva here, author, professor of exercise science, and host of Faith in Sport on WCAT Radio. Please join us as we discuss current events in the sports world, bring on inspiring guests, and discuss how our Catholic faith impacts all who are involved in sport, the athletes, the coaches, the referees, and yes, even the fans. So join me, Dr. John Aquaviva, as I discuss my two favorite topics, my faith and the world of sport, on the Faith in Sports show here on WCAT Radio. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.